Well, um, I think as some British colleagues have said before, this uh, children with specific language impairments seem to be a, a group of, of children who uh, the person on the street will never have heard of, and yet the prevalence of specific language impairment, kids who meet these criteria, are every bit as uh, common as dyslexic children, as children with ADHD, and much more common than children uh, on the autism spectrum. So, uh, because I think so much uh, in these children is intact, that is, these children exhibit normal hearing, they score at age-appropriate levels and nonverbal tests of intelligence, and they do not have any frank neurological damage or disease, uh, it's probably a little easier to pay more attention to children whose deficits are broader or whose deficits are having a very direct impact on academics, such as children with reading problems. But many of us who work in this area are very concerned because when we do long-standing longitudinal research in these children, we realize that their outcomes are uh, not so stellar. Um, these children are um, often having academic difficulties, including reading difficulties. Uh, they do have social problems, not so much because their social skills are so bad, but rather their, their language skills really do restrict their ability to interact, especially when you're talking about conversations among two, three people, coordinating language in that way is really difficult for these kids. Uh, and it even affects um, later on their, their economic um, functioning. I mean, these children eventually when they go through school and so on tend to be employed in obviously less verbal skills, but it has an impact on their economic well-being. So these are lifelong conditions. Uh, even though intervention most definitely can facilitate these children's language ability, it is nevertheless the case that it's a long-standing problem. And uh, so a lot of us are committed to making sure that uh, these children don't get lost in the shuffle, that we really do uh, research and learn much more about them. I think I, I see the biggest problem as a disconnect between the research world, even, I dare say, the clinic research world, clinical research world, and the, and the clinic practice world. I think there's a huge disconnect that I'm, I've always been very, um, very concerned about. A great case in point would be, um, we as researchers often use the term specific language impairment, and sometimes we argue among ourselves because we, on the one hand, recognize that for many of these children, as I noted earlier on, they have some subtle weaknesses in other areas, but they tend to be subclinical. They don't, they would never warrant a term like intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder or a, a frank motor impairment, but they are kind of weak in these areas. So some people have said, well, it, some people, you know, when they hear a term like specific language impairment and they know these kids are not so pure, that you know, maybe another term is relevant. So we argue among ourselves a bit, but we can define our kids where we can replicate our own studies. We know just who we're talking about. If you go to the clinical world, for instance, in um, school service um, you know, delivery systems, uh, no one uses the term specific language impairment. Zero. Um, and some of the alternative terms that are um, could be used, like primary language impairment, no. Uh, we don't. Uh, 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 some of that can be explained by the fact that, um, as I mentioned earlier on, children with specific language impairment are very much underserved uh, because uh, school systems and other agencies are hard pressed. Uh, they often have to deal with children of great severity. Right now, many children with autism spectrum disorders are being served. Um, and. Um, so therefore, children who would be closer to the kind of kids I study, if they're going to be served, very often they get referred only if, for instance, their language problems are such where it's, they're leading a child to act out in school, for instance. So there's now a little bit of a behavior problem component along with the language component. Or the child is somehow expressing some real overt emotional frustration. Or the child might have a, some other kind of problem in combination with a language problem. So clinicians in working in these settings are not seeing anything close to a pure case anyway. And so to them, specific language impairment is like, you know, saying, I've got a kid from Mars that I want you to see. They, they don't quite relate to it. And, and yet, to a, to a large degree, they are seeing some of the same kids, but they aren't called the same. And, you know, across different states, across different uh, regions of the country, uh, the terms are, are vary. Um, and the criteria for service delivery most definitely varies. So you can go from one school district
where they'll say a child has to have two scores, 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. One county over, they have to say one test with a score of two standard deviations below the mean. And they'll call the kid something slightly different in each case. And um, so I think there really needs to be, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm disappointed that researchers, even when they publish a lot, um, and we're making good grounds that somehow, especially in the terminology, we're not, it's not getting translated very well, you know? Uh, because if we were to apply that loose terminology that anything goes, uh, that sometimes one sees in the clinical world, if we were to apply it in research, no one could ever replicate a study, you know? Um, two people would do, you know, think they're doing the same study, come up with very different results. Why? Because the children are being selected in a wildly different way, because they weren't described in a, in a precise enough way. Early identification is, is, is really critical. Um, uh, uh, yesterday morning I participated in a panel on late talkers, for instance, and, and uh, there are a number of longitudinal prospective ta uh, studies on late talkers. These are, these are excellent studies. Uh, the problem is that to the field's surprise, uh, when these late talkers were followed, very few of them turned out to be diagnosed with a language impairment, much lower than the actual prevalence of the disorder. So if you ch follow children from 24 months to reach five years of age, the way late talkers had been defined, um, uh, precious few of them turned out to have a language impairment, uh, and the prevalence of specific language impairment is 7% among five-year-olds. And, and, and we weren't coming up with those, we the field, we weren't coming up with those kind of figures at all. Uh, which is a difficult because that says, well, okay, if all these kids at five years have language impairment, how do they get get there? You know, because only so many of them were in these late talker studies. Well, now we're getting the idea that, okay, we defined the field, defined late talkers, maybe in such a pure way. We looked at kids who were late in talking, but in other, way, in other ways they look so normal. Their birth history was fine. Develop, you know, their cognition was fine. Their hearing, of course, was fine. But their motor development is fine. They have absolutely nothing wrong with them. It's just that they weren't talking or they were talking quite late. Well, that might be too clean a profile for kids who eventually do have a cleaner profile. It could well be that these kids had somewhat broader de delays. I mean, we've always had the suspicion that these kids have some subtle weaknesses in other areas. Maybe they're their fine motor development is not quite as refined as, as would be. Maybe they've got some little, little messiness in their birth history that's not enough to cause great alarm, but it's enough that the physician, the pediatrician, would have made note of it, even though it didn't reach a clinical you know, stage and so on. And so you know, one of the things we can do is try to identify future SLI kids by, by broadening the profile you know, at 24 months that we look at children. And, and there, there are a few other things too, um, but, but, but it boils down to we need earlier identification techniques. Uh, other people in the field are starting to um, uh, adapt measures that uh, people studying young infants, typically developing infants, um, their early sentence processing. You know, there are these, you may have seen some of these looking tasks, you know, where children will hear a sentence and there'll be two pictures on a screen and these eye trackers will focus just where the kids are looking at it. 33 millisecond frames, you know, frame by frame, where are these kids looking, how quickly are they reacting? So for instance, some researchers have found that, that um, for instance, there's a, let's say there's a ball in a car and then the child hears something like, where's the ball, where's the ball? It's not only does the kid look at the ball, but how quickly in milliseconds does the kid turn his or her attention to the ball? In that, that the, the speed with which the kid within milliseconds switches to the, shall we say, the correct uh, object that's being heard actually has predictive value three or four years later. And so we just need to find other ways of, of identifying kids at an early age because this population you know, is not syndromic. They do not, you know, look differently. Um, they wouldn't have that kind of diagnosis if there was a huge medical complication at birth and so on. You know, we have to find other subtle ways of identifying future problems in these kids. The, the stock answer, and we need a lot of research on this as well, but the stock answer is, first of all, we need to be as certain as we can that, uh, that a child identified early on really is going to be seriously at risk for a language problem because we don't want to over-identify 
when so, because some of these kids are going to be late bloomers. But let's assume that in the we we do as a field come up with really accurate early identifications. Then of course the natural thing would be early in intervention. Um, but you don't want to intervene when so many of these kids are going to be fine without you. So, but so early intervention will be the answer. But then of course that that also prompts the question. Well. Um, do we have good early intervention techniques? And, and there are certainly procedures out there. Uh, this could bring, bring to the next topic, which, which you've heard a lot about, no doubt everyone in the field is, the, 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 uh, the importance of future randomized control trials and studies where large numbers of kids are randomly assigned to one group or another, and there are all kinds of very important controls built in, like the people who are s assessing the child's progress are blind to which condition the child was, which treatment condition the child was in, and um, we need to, we, the, so the next step will be those kinds of controls will need to be placed in early intervention programs, you know, so that'll be another important thing that's, that's going to be done, uh, we hope. So, um, and I think it's also going to be important in the old days, um, we used to take statistics that were kind of limited to analysis of variance kinds of designs. And now regression techniques, structural equation modeling is going to be uh, just you know more and more important. Um, and uh, also, it, it, one, one value about these techniques is that um, some of these boundaries between typically developing kids and clinically um, significant kids, some of these boundaries are really gray areas. They kind of shift around a lot. And, um, a lot of these statistical techniques are actually looking at the whole distribution of children. Kids who are in one continuum are very, very clearly impaired, and kids in another continuum are, are above normal. But you have everything in between rather than the, these discrete categories because we're really learning a whole lot about language processing in kids. And we're learning that you know, the difference between low normal and mildly impaired is not a qualitative difference. It seems to be a quantitative difference. So we need to have analytic techniques to take those things into account. And so I think young researchers would be really good to, uh, if their mentors are not already steering them in this direction, to, to uh, go in the direction of, you know, seeking out those kinds of analytic tools during their, their research preparation. At, at some point in the not distant future, I sure hope, we're going to have genetic and neurobiological measures, both neuroanatomical and electrophysiological measures, for instance, uh, and genetic measures and behavioral measures, finally starting to to uh, be coordinated. It's right now. It's tough. Uh, it's tough because, for instance, in the genetics world, we used to think um, for the longest time that um, the reason why. Uh, we couldn't really move forward in genetics, the field, why the field couldn't, is because, it's using specific language impairment as a good example, because the phenotype was a little bit inconsistent. You know, we would describe these kids slightly differently, and we recognize the heterogeneity. And so people said, well, geneticists would say, well, once you can really, can really pinpoint saying these kids and not these kids, these kids have the condition, these kids don't, then we can work on the genotype. Then we can really, well, as it turns out, it turns out that the genotype uh, is a bit complicated too, to say the least, because it seems to be a multifactorial disorder. There is no single gene with a variant or mutation that would be sufficient to create the symptoms of specific language impairment, just as there isn't for some of these other conditions that, that uh, the field is studying now. And we're talking about subtle combinations of genes, each contributing a very small amount of variance and probably interacting with the environment in ways we haven't fully appreciated yet that are creating these kinds of disorders. So in each of these areas, and neuroanatomically speaking, MRIs and functional MRIs for that matter as well, we're finding lots of group differences between kids with SLI and typically developed kids. Not, not damage, not like lesions or, or brain disease, but rather uh, configure brain configurations that are a little bit more atypical than one would expect. And of course, um, but the problem is that the particular brain configurations are a little different, will vary you know, from kid to kid, just as the genetic contribution seems to vary a little bit from kid to kid. So we have a long way to go, but what I'm really starting to see are big collaborative studies where people are, are bringing together, you know, as I said, neuroanatomical, electrophysiological, genetic, behavioral work, people from other disciplines, for instance, as well. Um, and uh, I really think we're going to be making good headway.